Okay. Um, we are starting where we left, <clears throat> more or less. So if any of you have uh, other questions about uh, this part of the topological analysis of the network, let me know, or if anything comes up even later, don't mind, uh, don't mind asking at any point. That goes for the participants, of course. Uh, the auditors, please uh, keep your mic and camera off and you'll have your question time after 5 p.m. Okay, so um, let's, uh, let's look first uh, to um, the thing that I forgot to do yesterday that I left behind, which was uh, uh, looking at how to start an assemblage from uh, previously saved uh, other assemblages, so that you can use uh, your saved assemblages as uh, and continue actually your assemblage from previous states. So that is also useful for some uh, modular operations. So you can do a part of the assemblage with a certain uh, heuristics and then change the heuristics and uh, try several attempts and then uh, build on top and do several trials with the, with the thing. To do that, uh, we'll have to go back a little to the material for um, day one, because that is where we have all the necessary components. Uh, so let me switch to... Um, Let's go to a simple random assemblage here. Uh, it should work. It will have the limited version of these components. Uh, there's just some extra geometry that this definition doesn't take. And also I need the components for uh, load and save that I will just uh, copy paste into my other definition. So here from, I'm gonna just take this block of components from the load and save definition that contain uh, the save assemblage, load assemblage, uh, and everything with the path, uh, just copying them and pasting them into this definition here. So I'm gonna just paste them over here. And I just need to connect my assemblage output here so that uh, when I will try to save uh, my, <clears throat> when I'll try to save my assemblage uh, is gonna go into the right place at the right uh, moment. So here are all the other saved parts. Uh, so let's say, let's call it for instance, part one. I'm going to avoid spaces just to make sure things don't break up, but it should be fine also with spaces in the name. Well, so let me actually just uh, step, make a few steps of this assemblage here, okay? All right, let's save this one as, um, Part one. Okay, the moment I save it, if I look at the directory again, inside assemblage, and I, there it is, part one, uh, zero, zero, zero. So that is index nine. So I'm gonna put index nine here. I'm going to reset my component uh, so that I can load the, this assemblage. Oh, and I need the, of course, I forgot that I need the assembly object set to rebuild the assemblage. So that's the assembly object set here. And I'm just going to connect that in here. Okay, so that's the 
assemblage that has been loaded and the assemblage is out of uh, here, right? So what I need to do to use this as a starting point for my next, uh, for, for, to go on from here. So let me just uh, switch this off. I just need to connect this uh, assemblage that I've loaded into this input here, AOPA, which means uh, assembly object previews assemblage. So when you connect that here and you hit reset, this time uh, the reset doesn't start anymore from uh, a single component, but it starts from the previously loaded uh, state. And it retains all of the information of, uh, of the assemblage, so you can still watch. Uh, I don't understand why the occupancy is not showing. That is weird. Oh, that's probably, mm -hmm. no, but it's weird. Well, I'll have to look into it, but generally it was working. Yeah, the type is working. Sequence is working. Ah, uh, no, because we, the available obs, okay. Uh, I know why the occupancy is not uh, showing up. It's not due to the property of the assemblies, but how this component works uh, on the instant, and especially what I am relying on to show the occupancy. Uh, I should actually change something in the visualization to be more reliable, but it's a, a minor thing. I mean, the, the information is correct inside the assemblies. So if you go further with your steps, yeah, as soon as uh, you give it the first round of uh, updates, uh, also the occupancy shows correct. But it's just because I'm relying on this thing and I and I shouldn't. So, so anyway, then you can uh, go on. Uh, the important thing to keep into consideration when you want to use a previously saved version is that the, the, um, the catalog of uh, object uh, should uh, either be exactly the same or uh, the assemblies that you have saved, uh, the object type in the assemblies that you have saved are part of the catalog that you're using uh, now and they have the same index. So let's say that you start, uh, for example, you do an assemblage uh, with uh, these two objects, and then uh, while you go on, you, wanna add, you want to add the third object to the set. The important thing is that uh, in the set, uh, the two objects that you used in the assemblies that you have saved are, will stay the same also in the new set. If you add something new, add it at the bottom so that uh, it, it, at, in terms of ID, ID0 and ID1 are the same as uh, for the assemblies that you have saved. So when you load it, the system will recognize all the right components and will put the right components in the right place. And then you can go on with the expanded set. Uh, if there is something missing in the set when you load it, those objects uh, will simply not load. Uh, let me show you, let me reset uh, this, or actually there was no need, well, um, let me switch off this preview, let's look at this preview here. So that's the set, right? Suppose that instead of uh, giving it the entire set, uh, Um, we give it just the first object, right? And we say load. We say load. Oh, no, it gives an error. Uh, I was pretty sure, well, yeah, no, it, no, it gives you an error. So the set should uh, contain all the instances that you saved. I was 
pretty much convinced that I programmed, well, that there should be a bug here in the code because the, the way I intended it was that, oh, probably, oh, I know what makes it uh, click. Is the topology. Well, sorry, uh, I was uh, speaking my mind aloud. Uh, so for the time being, uh, consider that uh, you have to, for, to provide a set that uh, contains the ID of the objects that have been saved. If there is something missing in the IDs, then uh, the load will fail. Um, so this is uh, this is it about uh, using a previously saved assemblage, uh, and then of course uh, you can do this thing incrementally. So you can save uh, the newly uh, obtained. Uh, assemblies and then reload that uh, and start again from there. So uh, this is also useful uh, for managing uh, a little bit the, some problems with the computation maybe so that at some point you can offload or if something goes wrong you don't start you don't have to restart from scratch all over again. Uh, so yeah use it as you as you feel fit, but um, the intended thing was uh, exactly to be able to work incrementally and save different version of the same thing so you can work comparatively with your design. All right, uh, let's see uh, a few things about uh, the design of the object now, okay? So I'm going to switch to a very small presentation that I prepared. So let's wait for the presentation to load. Okay, so when you design uh, objects uh, for uh, uh, something that has to work in connection with something else, there are some uh, interesting principles at work that become uh, useful. Uh, there are two things that needs to be kept in mind that are uh, related to um, the fact that uh, you have something that will repeat itself, it will repeat itself a lot. So both percept perceptually and uh, at the information level for what contains the, per pertains the information structure and the spatial structure, this repetition and uh, the structure of the object uh, have a very important uh, role uh, in the design. So um, one of the principles at work uh, here, uh, in order to have a design that enables the formation of uh, a pattern that is not obvious and that is, doesn't just uh, reflect uh, the uh, so-called uh, tileability of the system, which is doesn't show that the system is in fact made of out of the same tiles, but enable the emergence of uh, a larger pattern of variation. One of the most uh, diffused and well-known principles is the principles of the Truchet tiles. Truchet was a mathematician uh, and uh, Believe it or not, all of these patterns are all made out of the same tile, just rotated 90 degrees, or uh, 90 degrees or 180 degrees. The, the original Truchet tiles are exactly the one on the top left of this picture, where you just take a square and you cut it in, the, in a diagonal and you have a white and black triangle. Then just go on and randomly rotate the style 90 degrees clockwise or counterclockwise. And what you get are those patterns that uh, emerge like this. Uh, same principle if you don't cut the tile diagonally, but you cut the tile uh, parallel to one of the sides in the middle, and you still make half black and half white, uh, this is what you get on the top right. And by the, by, the, by the sheer principle that uh, white and black area connect seamlessly, you get the emergence of this other pattern. Now that I told you that uh, they are made out of the same tile, you start seeing it, but before telling that, it was harder to, to perceive because then you could see the larger pattern. 
Uh, some of them are uh, the, the classical or less classical version of the um, famous computer algorithm uh, in, in one line that was the go to 10 uh, algorithm. Uh, it was like uh, generate a random number between 0 and 1. Uh, if it's below 0, 05, uh, put a certain character, otherwise, put another character like a backslash and forward slash. Then repeat, go to 10. This was programmed on uh, Commodore 64, if I am correct. And that's what you get in the middle to the right. So middle left uh, is, uh, OK, you divide by the two diagonals and just make a quarter of the square black and then rotate in angles of 90 degrees. And the last one on the bottom uh, right is the perhaps the most famous version of the Truchet tiles, the one that was done by Sirius Stanley Smith with the two arcs. So you basically have a square and connect uh, the four midpoints with two arcs connecting uh, consecutive sides. When you rotate this tile 90 degrees and start seeing the connections, you start to see the emergence of these either circles or this uh, squiggly uh, patterns. But the interesting thing is uh, because of the uh, possibility of connection, you're, you're not working with a design that it's enhancing uh, the limit or the perimeter of the tile. You work with a figure that actually uses the tile for its modularity, but then creates uh, dif the possibility of different and larger pattern by the fact that there's some incompleteness to it. But at the same time, it's uh, relying, it's a strange way of re relying to symmetry, right? If you look at it. But uh, in none of these cases, there is uh, the enhancement of the perimeter or the, or the boundaries of the tile. It works uh, from the inside and then uh, enhances some of the connections so that what you see is actually uh, something at the global level, and you and you lose the um, the perception of the single tile. If you think that all of these are working on a grid of squares, but you don't see the grid of squares in anywhere in this part, uh, that is pretty uh, interesting, and it does something about the principle. In, uh, that's another interesting case. Uh, this is a case uh, in one of the project uh, that. Uh, Giret Sen uh, and his team followed at the Bartlett. Uh, it, it's the project about the pizza bots, if I'm not wrong. But the interesting thing is that uh, what you see there, it's also another uh, interesting example of another design principle, which is the Accenture. Where, where do you put the Accenture to get these patterns out of? In the previous cases, the Accenture was the fact that you use the white and black for instance, or in this case, this the accenter is given by the um, two kind of uh, indents in the in in the model. The model is really a a very very simple uh, block, flat block, uh, and then it has like a longitud longitudinal indent and an L shaped indent. But when given the combination rule and uh, the way these uh, objects can combine, you have the emergent in a larger assembly of all of these uh, changing and uh, varying patterns that you see at the bottom. So what you see in the top uh, around the center of the screen, are it's the heuristics table, basically. So the table of all the possible combination between the objects. So it's not so much about the shape of the object, uh, rather than uh, being clever in terms of uh, where you uh, design the, con the possibility of the connectivity of the object. And if you think the geometry in terms of connectivity, uh, then you start using it. In this way, in this example, uh, you can see that, I don't know if you notice it, but uh, it's not just the, the sides that are connecting uh, one to each other. It's also, oops, sorry, my bad. It's also in this part, uh, it's using the thickness the thickness is connecting to the plate part in uh, some uh, predefined uh, sections. 
so that this pattern can continue even if it's uh, if the parts are placed not uh, 180 degrees to each other but 90 degrees to each other and one is placed not in the thickness part but on the plate part so it's using uh, even though the component is really is really really simple the connectivity rule uh, enable a lot of variation and complexity in the assemblage and that's a, a very interesting and, and clever design method. Another project, uh, uh, I know it's, that sounds like a sort of a spot for Gilles Redsens. Uh, well, Gilles is a friend, so kudos to him for, for his work. It's just the fact that uh, there are a lot of uh, uh, examples out there done. He, he got into his way of designing uh, first and he produced a lot of things. And it's very interesting to pick some of the examples and work, uh, work our way back, backtracking and uh, sort of uh, reverse engineering the project to understand how the design is, uh, is kind of working and why the design produces this kind of uh, uh, results. So also in, in this case, uh, this is a little less obvious than the previous case. But it's still uh, uh, one of the interesting part is to look at, uh, for example, look at this uh, uh, model here. One of the interesting thing is that uh, the vertical division is not uh, split evenly; it's split, uh, it's unevenly split. But this uh, size, this dimension is exactly equal to this dimension. So that there is uh, a lot of modular possibility that enhance not a perfect tileability in terms of uh, voxel space. You don't just generate uh, eternally flat voxel grids, or but you, you can generate this variation of uh, levels from one part to the other, and also there is a, a clever thought about two kind of. Uh, diagonal direction that are modular uh, with themselves. So there is a part that gets and click exactly into place with this. There's another part that clicks exactly into place with that. But not everything uh, always uh, saturates the space. So this leaves uh, some voids internal. This is thought as, uh, um, as a housing unit. So there are houses and also the diagonals allow you to uh, embed easily vertical connections like stairs uh, or have uh, a space that has this uh, slanted uh, walls inside. So it's not so much about uh, looking at the project for the sake of the project itself, but at these modularity principles and why at some point these patterns emerge or they work. That's another clever use of the edges here uh, as a way of uh, implementing Accenture is then uh, using the, both the edge of the profiles and the edge of the connection profiles and working by color contrast, uh, you get this, some, this sort of uh, self ornamentation out of it. The pattern can work uh, in multiple ways. They work perceptually, they work uh, um, for the organization, for the orientation, for the distribution of things. Uh, there are several ways in which you can uh, uh, read these patterns uh, and uh, apply their structure to, to your project, to your work. Looking at that from, um, from a more uh, abstract perspective, if you want, a detail works as a sort of uh, procedural information. So uh, it's a, a kind of a basic unit of information that, uh, again, by virtue of the way in which uh, the information are then organized uh, in the assemblage, you have the emergence or the possibility of emergence of large and pattern that, and these patterns work. Uh, by densification or rarefaction. So you can see changes in the density of the elements or directionality. So you can uh, trace uh, changes or understand patterns in terms that they are indicating uh, some specific direction or other directions, uh, 
but you see the emergence more or less like uh, you see the emergence of directionality when you see a, a, a wind map or or um, or a field flow map with arrows, right? It's not completely chaotic, but you see uh, directionality of the arrows. Even if the arrows are not pointing all in the same direction, you can see the emergence of a pattern of directions there. Uh, both of these uh, indicators are the, the reflection of a distribution uh, within the system. So this is related to how the system processes this data and generates this distribution. This has to do with uh, the, or the in inner order of the system, so that when you try to process some data with uh, that order, that system generates that kind of distribution. And... All right. Well, just let me switch this off. Uh, let's see a few. Let's see a few examples. I mean, the I sent you a couple of uh, files that uh, they are like uh, mm, very very tentative and untested uh, kind of components. But the the hope is that you try to um, design your own components. I just wanted to make some consideration both on the design and also something that is very important uh, for the system to work uh, on uh, how do you design and to uh, how do you uh, generate uh, somehow the collision mesh out of your geometry. Uh, some do's and don'ts uh, that I already know that uh, things that actually uh, lead you a little bit astray or, or uh, things that uh, actually work with, uh, with the way that we are working. I think your mic is off again. Yeah, we don't hear you. Uh, yeah, no. or um. Okay. Do you hear me now? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, for whatever reason, uh, the the connection uh, with the microphone uh, just uh, decided to stop. Uh, what was the last thing that you heard from me? The do's and don'ts about uh, creating the components. Okay, great, thanks. Uh, all right, so let's go to to the material that I gave you. Uh, there is a folder in the material, in yesterday's material, and it's called Mesh Modeling. So let me first uh, open just a new document here in Grasshopper, and actually I'm not really needing that very much. So in this uh, Mesh Modeling folder, uh, there are three files. Uh, uh, one is a collection of uh, 3D people in low poly so that you can uh, use it to see the proportions. It's, I, I suggest that uh, whenever you start working with uh, your, uh, your project, your assemblage, you start immediately with uh, size and proportion that are already set uh, for uh, uh, working with a figure in, in scale so that you immediately have the sense of space that you're creating. Uh, another one is uh, just a, a very quick uh, summary of mesh modeling techniques uh, and actually mesh modeling techniques to generate something that is low poly. And if you are not very familiar uh, on modeling with the gumball in Rhino or modeling with the mesh or modeling with mesh in Rhino, there are a few basic techniques, uh, but uh, you really don't have to to go too far in uh, uh, designing the geometry. And the last one, uh, which is actually the one that I wanted to show you right now, it's a kind of a table of proportion. So consider this as uh, just uh, orientative. It's not an obligation, okay? But uh, if you have no idea on the scale of the space that 
you want to design and you want a starting point, uh, this table uh, is uh, set to, let's say, work with a very, very minimum of uh, something that is two by two meters to give you an idea of what happens when you are in uh, a space that is more or less uh, 11 meter by 11 meter. So whenever you're designing your components, your modules, uh, this uh, is kind of a reference scale to help you, okay, let's tune it up uh, and see what they, I mean, if you want to do something that is 20 or 30 meters long, uh, I don't mind. I mean, we are in a very, very highly speculative and abstract uh, scenario here. It, it doesn't have to, to be strictly related to this, but it's just a starting point uh, for the design. Okay, what am I doing? I mean, am I doing something that makes sense uh, for the people to walk through? It's not for the people. So that's design. If you want to design something with other biological species or non-biological species, well, that's uh, entirely up to you. But in this case, you have to provide scale figures for that. And um, the the other thing, uh, uh, it's just to keep uh, tied to the scenario that we are. I would like you to design something that it's not on the scale of. Uh, uh, construction components, but on the scale of uh, spa spatial, uh, uh, not units, but spatial parts that contain space, that have a void, an empty inside of them. So the examples that I showed yesterday and this morning are most probably what you can call uh, some uh, placeholders that uh, wrap up uh, something that is pretty much uh, a lot of empty space inside, right? Not, not uh, like solid objects that we are sticking together. Uh, let me start with um, with one example of the files that I've sent to you uh, just a few minutes before we started today. So I don't remember if they were here. Okay. Okay, in this case, I'm not in need of uh, Grasshopper right now, so I can expand the uh, Rhino. So I made a few very, very quick uh, and tentative uh, components that also have some uh, handles uh, on them. Just to give you an idea of uh, the level of really simplicity that you can, uh, that are enough for this. So these are all based uh, on um, on the properties of a square and with the fact that, for instance, this size is identical to the height. So this component can orient itself uh, with this rotation or if I rotate it 90 degrees, this surface that was uh, in this uh, perspective is like a floor and this is a wall, the relations reverse. So if we rotate this object, uh, let me just make a copy of it, just to... And if we rotate it 90 degrees, then the relations are reversed, but it's still uh, in terms of geometry, it's perfectly compatible with the with itself, right? But in this case, this has become the, the floor, that has become a ceiling, and that has become a wall. So don't think when you're designing, uh, uh, one aspect is to try to, don't, even if you think about the proportion with the figure, is to resist the temptation of giving uh, the surfaces uh, already some sort of uh, functional destination. Say, okay, I'm designing this component and I'm designing a floor, I'm designing a column. Yeah, let, let's call them, uh, I'm designing a surface, I'm designing a sort of a slender element. And let's watch later what happens when we put it in the engine for the assemblies, what they become in the context of a larger assemblage. Okay, so that's one pointer. 
Second thing, uh, uh, try to work uh, the least possible with the boundaries. So if I do a bounding box uh, of this, uh, let's uh, generate curves for, for that. So the basic modular figure, it's still a cube and it's made to work with the proportions of the cube, but it doesn't en enhance uh, too much the, the details of a cube. If you want to be even more generic with that, instead of placing uh, the horizontal slab here at the bottom, it could be placed somewhere halfway and have another element sticking down here. So that instead of having uh, uh, a complete uh, space and uh, uh, a boundary element on one frontier, you get uh, an a separator element in the middle, but you actually leave all the sides free for connections. And you design, uh, in this case, there are, vertically speaking, two half spaces. But on the other direction, it's just a single space in vertical, right? In this direction, I can see I have designed two half spaces because if I connect this, on this side, what I'm getting is another full space twice the size. If I'm not placing this exactly in the middle, something else might happen because the split of the space is uneven. And then I'm breaking the symmetry, which means I uh, increase the, the possible catalog of generated spaces. If I keep this in the middle, like this, every time I put uh, one, uh, I put both of this uh, to the side. Yeah, let's get this poly surface. Let me get a copy. Uh, so if we copy it multiple times and I put this side by side by side, all I can get will always be a space like this, right? But if I move this slightly, uh, now I don't know if I can do that. Did I group it or? I don't remember if I grouped it or if I, no, I just uh, joined it in a, in a poly surface. Never mind. I'm going to do a couple of boxes very quick. So let's separate it. Okay, so imagine that instead of having it in the middle, you move it slightly. So right now you have uh, several, uh, at least two possible combination in the same uh, direction. One is this, the other one is with this guy rotated uh, 180 degrees. So the distance between the walls is actually changes. So you have actually have three combinations because then you have uh, both of them placed uh, like this. So you have also something like uh, possibly a corridor or some more narrow space inside. So when you break symmetry, you actually stop having the same thing from one side to the other and then uh, the same, the combination that were equal in symmetry become unequal and then you have more heterogeneity in the system. So you have to be pretty careful in balancing this with the tiling principle I was, uh, I was talking about before. Fortunately, you have a very, very quick way of finding out uh, if the geometric consistency of the system uh, uh, works and how it works, because then uh, once you model the components uh, and you uh, reference them and build the, an assembly object out of them and their handles, it's very, it's very easy and it's very fast uh, to try them in an assemblage and see how they work or see the heuristics first and say, okay, let's see how these things combine. And then you can just move on the fly some of the handles or change their location to try to understand how to make things uh, work in a certain way. 
What certainly it's less useful to the cause is try to uh, overcomplicate the geometry, like to add the unessential details or uh, another thing uh, that I've seen done, uh, like uh, you, a lot of people that I've been working with, they were starting with uh, very, very um, closed geometries, meaning that uh, they were not thinking in terms of modularity, but they were thinking about placing object over object and then uh, probably connecting. Uh, case in point, sometimes, sometimes I had to face some geometry that were like some tubes uh, intersecting. And the result was uh, actually really, really terrible because then you could uh, uh, really notice the, um, the the tile junction between the components because you had this terrible kitchen tile effect, badly designed kitchen tile effect, because there was no uh, extra emergent pattern. You could only see the element and the repetition of that element. Ideally, the element should make should be so generic that in the end. Uh, the individual disappears and the uh, group effect emerge. The other part of the model is this L-shaped tile that uh, works vertically with the same principle and the same size, but then it has to be put into, into action to see what it does. I didn't have the time to, to test it, I'm sorry, otherwise I would have done it. Uh, these ones are more for uh, a possible principle of modularity, but think of these as wrappers and there is something happening in terms of void inside. It's just like big Amazon packages, big weird Amazon packages with a lot of space inside. It's just for the modular shape of the thing because then you have these faces that are compatible with each other, but all the other square faces are all compatible with each other in all rotations. So it could be interesting to put this at work and see what kind of uh, spatial density can come out of these guys. When you start putting them together, I, I was trying to do this uh, manually a little bit, uh, um, and it's interesting. Uh, this one, uh, the last one, doesn't have the handles, uh, but I was trying to build some uh, circuitry. Yeah, no, it has the handles actually. Yeah, it has the handles there, but not everywhere. I was just able to place the handle there, really. Oh no, yeah, some handles in the But it's missing, uh, it's still missing a lot of handles. Uh, it's still working uh, with a sort of a modularity principle. So if I get a bounding box of the object, uh, the, the plan is a square. So like these two guys are actually the same guys rotated. And the stair was the extra element at work here. It still need, needs to be tested, but uh, just to make something that has some more functional architectural element to them, uh, it probably needs to be completed with something that works also in the other direction. So the stair in this case would just be an extra geometry that you put uh, just in certain cases, like we saw this morning. Uh, so let's say that you have a reference plane and you can add the stairs only if this guy lands uh, horizontal. If this guy lands vertical, of course, you don't want to put a 90 degrees vertical uh, oriented stair because it really doesn't make uh, much sense if not in Asher's painting. Um, yeah, that's much uh, really, really little about this. Uh, one important thing is when you model your object, uh, uh, especially in Rhino, it's a lot more convenient to start modeling with B reps, but at some point you have to generate a mesh uh, because of the extrusion, because of the gumball, because of the control that you can have, because of the fact that uh, you can design already solids and you have all the flexibility of solid operations in Rhino. So uh, now this is a, a really simple geometry, right? The, the right way to get uh, um, a, a collision mesh right away from this object uh, would be to first uh, try to make a Boolean union with all the B reps. So in case you already don't, 
you don't uh, have it already, make a copy of these objects and work on a copy so that you get a unique uh, polysurface. And then when you, uh, you can try to mesh it. So if the shapes uh, are this simple, you can just crank the slider for the polygon mesh option all the way to the left, to the left, to fewer polygons. You can see the preview and it will use it the least number of polygons possible. Uh, if you have uh, flat planes, uh, square figures, uh, uh, always, almost always the, um, the result will be a, a really, really low point. Like in this case, this mesh is really okay because it has a very, very uh, low amount of faces. So if you look at that, uh, this is like uh, 16 faces only, which is very good for the system for testing the collision. Of course, when your geometry becomes uh, a little bit more complex or articulated, uh, it might be the case at some point uh, you, you might have to model a separate object uh, that uh, loses some of the detail, but it's enough uh, to check the collision. Uh, I'm going to show you with the file, uh, I'm going to show you a distinction between uh, relevant and unrelevant detail. Uh, I didn't share this with you because it's actually an example from my students and I didn't want this to, to go around, but it's just uh, useful to show you certain principles. Yeah. And actually, let me... I'm gonna take the chance to also send you another link. I'm gonna send these links in the Zoom chat. Uh, provided that I found it, uh, mm, mm -hmm. yeah. uh -huh. Okay, I got them. So I'm going to send you three links on uh, on the Zoom group chat. So uh, you need the uh, Chrome browser to visit these links. These are the um, these are the, the um, Modelo version of their exam project. So the project that you see that you will see at these links has been built with this element or these elements. Uh, there are like uh, three, three links because it's like two versions. Uh, these are the two cable car stations I was showing uh, in the introductory lecture yesterday. And the third one is uh, like a sort of a detail modeling, uh, uh, constructive detail modeling of, uh, of this part here. So, uh, the design of the component uh, is this one that you see in green, right? So they decided to go for something like this that has this optional element here in this, uh, this sort of uh, groove right here. So this, uh, this part is like a filler in case nothing is there. But the thing is, uh, this groove is useful because actually this part, when you rotate this guy, let's say 180 degree and make a copy, I need to just move it a little bit up because uh, that's not exactly, oh, or, well, just the wrong guy. Okay, so how the, this is how the pieces fit in one to each other. So the groove, uh, the groove is actually a relevant detail because if you do collision check, the groove has to stay. 
because the, it's the, the the way in which the pieces are coming together. What's not relevant or not really relevant is this curve over here. Because uh, the fact that this curve is there or not, uh, if it's there or it's not there for all of the components involved, uh, it doesn't change anything in the, in the collision. It doesn't change anything in the connectivity. You just know that uh, if you place a handle in here, it's going to be of the same type of the handle that you have to put in here. But the fact that this has a curve or not really doesn't affect at all the, the connectivity or the collision of the model. So if you try and uh, mesh like this thing uh, right away, right off the bat, you end up with this collision mesh, which all in all, well, it's not that bad. I've seen worse, but it's still uh, unnecessary complicated in terms of amount of faces. And this is the lowest, uh, uh, the lowest parameter in the meshing, uh, uh, in in the mesh command in Rhino. Still, if you, if we look at at it, it nine hundred and thirty five faces, which is a lot. If we want to go up in numbers, consider that. Uh, more or less, the, the basic goal is to work with uh, uh, something with around 10,000 components or more. Think about the, compo the, the, the engine trying to do this collision check uh, with uh, thousands and thousands of elements. Uh, that uh, it, it makes a lot of difference if you have to rely in, on a few dozen faces or almost a, a thousand faces, like in this case. So the idea in this case is to, okay, let's model something from scratch, something like this. So modeling the groove uh, precisely, but uh, leaving the curvature aside. So what you get is a collision mesh like this one, which is precise in terms of the groove, which is the relevant detail here, but uh, it leaves aside the uh, this part. So then when you have uh, oriented all the pieces, you can orient uh, all this, this, this piece in the place of the collision mesh all you want. But that comes after the, um, the collision. So this guy, instead of uh, 900 and something, is 30 faces. So it's like, uh, yeah, 30 times less. Right? which is a huge uh, savings in terms of, uh, of space. So same thing goes for these other components here. So just please try to pay attention to what is a, a relevant detail in terms of uh, component design for connectivity and what becomes a, a sort of, uh, okay, that's part of the geometry of the component and I want the geometry to be like that because it also, this curve, uh, it's important for the project uh, because it delivers a, a, a particular unique sense of identity to the project. If you look at the models uh, uh, in the link that I've sent you, you realize that this kind of visual and uh, constructive geometric accent uh, works very well for the project, but it's irrelevant uh, when it comes to the process of assemblage. So, of course, uh, there is this aspect, so we need to be able to maintain it for the final version. But when it comes to the assemblies process, we need to try to dry out every non-relevant information out of the system and feed to the system only what's important for the process of assemblies. Everything else can be then replaced afterwards. Any questions about uh, this part? So this was like some manual. Uh... Manual assemblies that I did with uh, with their components, but the. Um, actually, I'm curious about one thing. Yeah. Um, so you said probably ideally we should design the um, the components not according the function of mm -hmm. the later of an architecture like the stairs or corridors or whatever 
instead of breaking down the space that like what do you say like one room is basically um combined by different parts mm -hmm. it's not it's i mean i don't know the design approach you would probably um yeah uh, uh, well uh, let's say that combination in the end you make uh, some uh, negotiation in the in the process so let's say that uh, for instance the uh, not all the elements uh, for instance this uh, the, the stairs are one of those elements that i would uh, personally keep it as a post processing uh, infill option to add afterwards first of all uh, uh, i would focus on uh, designing a module that deals uh, with uh, probably the surfaces and then according to how the surfaces uh, end up uh, uh, working in the assemblage, uh, make my modifications uh, and then starts to give the surfaces a sort of a functional uh, mapping once I see them in the assemblage. So then uh, a surface can become a floor, can become a wall, or some elements can become a column or can become something else according to their uh, placement and uh, connections in the assembly. So that's another, uh, actually that leads to another important, uh, important indication for the design process, which is uh, uh, resist also the temptation to focus uh, on one thing at a time. Uh, so don't wait uh, to design the perfect component before starting trying it into the assemblage. Instead, you have to close the loop uh, very fast, uh, very quick, uh, and uh, have some quick feedback. You design uh, a rough tentative component, but design also the connection. You see it in action in, uh, in an assemblage. And then uh, you go immediately back uh, with the feedback to modify what, whatever you feel like you need to modify the component. Or maybe there is something that uh, you, would like to, you would like to change uh, in the way, in, in the criteria of the assemblage. But uh, all, of this, all of the parts of the design pipeline have uh, um, have ramification into the other, so uh, they 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 basically propagate every action you do in a, in a part of the design pro process propagates to the rest. So uh, I've since I've seen this uh, a lot of time because it's uh, pretty actually it's pretty tempting and for the way that we, in general one works to. Uh, stop and refine the design a lot at one stage without uh, running all the other stages. Uh, what I'm trying to say is this, uh, do the thing in one stage uh, very quickly, but whenever you do something, uh, uh, immediately go through all the rest of the stages and see how the things are playing out. Because the, cons the consequences of a choice that you make at any stage uh, cannot be measured on that stage alone. You need to see the consequences of your action to at all stages of the design. So uh, this is also the reason why uh, I wanted to try to put together uh, a, a tool that uh, made, uh, hopefully, <laughs> the, it's still a work in progress, uh, like I said, but uh, try to make uh, more fast and intuitive as possible the going through all the stages of the design process for this workflow so that you don't have i mean okay like i said before you start with a very very tentative idea of uh, geometry thinking how it might uh, connect and what it might create and then uh, you look at the heuristics you look at an assemblage and then okay let's go back and maybe modify the object, maybe change something in the heuristics, pick something, leave something else out. And I mean, there are, there are so many uh, possibilities at each stage from the, uh, the component design to the choice of heuristics to the choice of how you use the heuristics. Maybe you want to use a, a certain very limited uh, kind of heuristics uh, 
produce and assemble it, save it, and then go on from there with a totally different heuristic set, with same components, because you know they create a very different condition. And then you want to go on. And then maybe you come up with the, uh, a way of uh, teasing out this condition through a field. And then you work that way. I mean, there is no preconceived uh, recipe, or you don't have to think too much about the recipe from the get-go, from the beginning. Of course, the start is always, always that you need the geometry for the component to work. So for sure, the, the, the starting point for everyone is to designing a very first uh, tentative set of components. But from there, it's really uh, a very, very uh, personal kind of uh, uh, kind of path through through all the possibilities of the design space. And you have to try to make sense of how to navigate that space with the, with this kind of tool that uh, we are using for the workshop. So, um, I mean, if there are no mm, questions or other thing, uh, I am um, mostly done with the explanation. I would probably have uh, something more to add uh, to your uh, possibilities and tool set, or maybe also start talking more about uh, how we want to, to root uh, the topic uh, more. But uh, for this afternoon, uh, for the rest of this afternoon, uh, I would like you to start uh, playing with things, start to come up with some uh, very early component design, uh, trying it in an assemblage, uh, try to see, okay, let's see how to design uh, uh, an object. Or actually, you know what? Uh, before doing that, uh, if, if you would like to do so, or otherwise uh, you tell me otherwise, uh, would you like to see at least uh, step by step the process of going from uh, one component in terms of geometry to reference it and building an assembly object in Grasshopper? Yes, that would be good. But can we make it like a yeah. five minute pause, please? Sorry. We have like a small break, five minutes. Yes, uh, exactly. I was uh, about to say that if you want me to do that, uh, we will do it after a break. <laughs> So it's uh, 3.15, let's say that we are back at 3.30, okay? Okay, thank you. <clears throat> thank you, let's have a break and see you in 15 minutes. I'm just uh, pausing my mic.
excuse me. Yeah. Uh, when you uh, turn the nerves uh, surface to the mesh, it's kind of messy. Should we uh, refine the edges to uh, place the L-shaped line? Uh, what do you mean? It's kind of messy. Uh, I mean, it's uh, too much um, triangles. <laughs> Ah, yes, that's uh, the, the problem I was uh, talking about earlier. In uh, We also see it uh, with the case of this. It depends uh, what is your shape. And of course, uh, I mean, that uh, that's a basic thing. Uh, uh, when you design for uh, connectability, you have to make sure that uh, the shape that you want to connect actually have the same shape and are uh, clicking in place just like puzzle pieces. For example, it, it, you can also put the handles on a sphere, for instance, but in terms of assemblies, it doesn't make much sense to have uh, elements that are touching only on one point, right? It's, uh, it, it, it's essentially, it uh, demotes the constructive uh, philosophy that is behind this. So modularity, it's the basis of constructability, which means the fact that you have compatible joints, uh, so the joints uh, stick together by shape, essentially. Yes. So if you, yeah, the, the problem might be that if you're, if, if you want to use a curved geometry, that's fine by me. But uh, like I said before, consider the fact that uh, for the collision, Curve geometry might be not relevant, so you you might have to design a sort of uh, low poly, very low poly mesh wrapper, sort of like think about that you have to wrap up and package it to to, to gift it to somebody, or that the fact that uh, when you have to design connections, when you design connection with uh, flat pieces. You know, certain aspects like uh, continuity, tangency are implicit because you're working with flat pieces and uh, the things are connecting uh, and the continuity is ensured, especially if uh, the connection happens not just uh, point to point, not just line to line, but uh, face to face, which is a, a true, let's say, planner uh, uh, coincidence of two identical elements that are connecting together. If you use curvature, so suppose that instead of having this flat somewhere, there are some, some curve arriving, or let me draw here something. So suppose that we are looking at this in 2D, uh, we're looking at it from above, and this is the section that we use to connect one piece with the other. So if you arrive with uh, whatever curve, let's say, we do something like this. Um, I'm doing something really terrible on purpose, so don't copy me, okay? Suppose that you want to connect this to itself, okay? What you do is uh, just to take this and uh, copy, rotate uh, 180 degrees and see how it connects to itself. So you see where Part of the problem already is here and here. Because when you work with the curves, uh, you also have to consider other two factors, which are tangency and continuity. The kinks uh, are a dead giveaway for uh, the fact that your system is made of tiles. And in terms of design, it's better to avoid that because otherwise the the, the whole perception of the object or the emergence of the system as an assemblage and not just a pile of uh, tiles or piles of individual bricks uh, is uh, actually destroyed. So either you are able to work uh, and maintain uh, tangency, maintain continuity so that uh, actually the joints are something that it's necessary for the system to uh, work, but the system should not uh, 
display the fact uh, that uh, it's made out, should, the individual parts should not stick out uh, in the global system. And if you make it uh, overly complicated, like with curves in this case, it's really hard to, um, first of all, it's hard uh, to make things that work in an ensemble because uh, it works by quantity. So another reason to, uh, be in between uh, double brackets, to dump down the design uh, and please take it in the most uh, positive spirit. I'm not, uh, I'm, I'm not uh, trying to be offensive in any way here, but dump down means that uh, complexity will not reside uh, in uh, how uh, complex or complicated the shape of the individual item is. Complexity is bound to emerge uh, out of the in organization of those individual parts and out of the quantity of parts that you pour into the system. That is the <clears throat> main objective uh, or the main thing to look for if you are looking for complexity <clears throat> in your system. Just uh, as a case in point, let me show you again uh, the case of the pizza box, Jill's pizza box. So the complexity of these parts over here, let me see if I can uh, zoom in a little more so you can see. Well, even if they are a little uh, low resolution, but you can still uh, understand it a bit better. Let's go to 100%. So the complexity that you see here is not due to the complexity of the part. The part like you've uh, like you've noticed uh, in here, it's very very. It's the, one of the simplest part you could. I mean, it's as simple as it gets. There's probably nothing simpler than this in terms of uh, design. But that's not the point. The point is the fact that design works uh, not because the the shape is. Uh, complicated or enriched by fancy details is just that the, it's the clever detail that works in, in the ensemble. And if you take these things individually, they are really not, not so much in themselves. But it's what they do in the organization that's, that matters. So try to design with this focus in mind. That is important. It, I know it's a uh, uh, it's not uh, the usual uh, the usual way in which uh, uh, sometimes designs are trained, but it's uh, interesting and also important to understand uh, if you want to get uh, the maximum takeaway out of this uh, design process, right? Yes, thank you. Welcome. So let's see. Uh, Let's see um, a really, really fast uh, workflow on how to go from the Rhino model to the Grasshopper assembly object, right? So this is one of the files that you should have as an example. It's called uh, hexa.3dm. It's, it's inside the components. It should be inside the components folder. So if I look at the Rhino layers here, you will see that uh, there is uh, there are it's already uh, divided into layers. So there is a layer for the B wrap geometry. There is a layer for the connection path. That are actually there are still some polylines. So we'll have also to break this down in individual lines. But still, even if though they are still polylines, they at least uh, the the connection are always in the uh, endpoints or elbow points and not in the middle of the line. And uh, there are already a certain number of handles. So the the handles are really oversized, but the the scale of the polyline, the size of the polyline doesn't matter because it's just a placeholder to know where you've put uh, your connections. So the scale of uh, this polyline is really up to you if you want to make it like very much recognizable, if you want to be as minimal as possible. I mean, the important thing is that it means something, the, the size of this polyline means something to, to you. 
So uh, I'm going to use uh, the, oh, come on, that's, sorry. That's the Zoom, the, the zoom uh, control panel that drops down annoyingly. So let me see if I have it already in here, in the list. Uh, yeah, I'm going to use this uh, heuristic setup uh, that I used um, this morning. We're going to make a few modifications. Uh, so I'm going to just save it uh, as a new document uh, so that I can reference uh, all the important geometry from this guy. And I'm going to save it like, uh, let's say, 011 one, uh, heuristic setup uh, for the hexa. OK, so that I know that here, the this one should be the hexa.3dm, the file that we reference. So first of all, the first thing, uh, actually, before we start referencing things, into Grasshopper is that I'm missing a collision mesh. I have my B-wraps, but I'm still missing the collision mesh. So let's try the uh, fast track. So I'm just selecting all my B-wraps. Uh, there are also the polylines that I use to generate uh, part of the B-wraps. And I'm going to make uh, a copy. With the gumball, it's pretty easy because uh, you drag, you press Alt once, uh, you will see this little plus uh, symbol next to the, your crosshairs. And that means that you're in copy mode. Whenever you release the mouse, you've made a copy. So I'm going to try and Boolean a union all these together, see if I'm, I'm lucky. So let me go to the shaded view. So. I can better see the thing. So if you look at the object and the handles, uh, it's, uh, again, based on a modular design, which is another suggestion that I give you if you want to start with something that uh, has a multiple combination possibilities, start with modules. In this case, uh, the module is based on a square that has this length, and then this length uh, is repeated here, 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 three times uh, at the base. So the base is like a, a three to one proportion of the same module. And then it's using a 45 degrees angle to connect uh, these parts. Uh, I didn't think about placing handles in the diagonal faces, but it still should be possible. So let's turn this into a mesh. So this is a pretty uh, straightforward and flat geometry. It, it doesn't have any curved parts. So if I use the mesh command with a very low poly options, so all the way to fewer polygons, it seems like the mesh is pretty OK, not too complicated. Uh, I don't think it can get even simpler than this. But if you want to go to the detail controls, uh, you'll see what this uh, simple controls for the fewer possible polygons look like in this, uh, in this scenario here. Uh, so simple planes actually helps a lot when you have some flat parts because it's going to try to merge all the planner, all the co-planner faces. That's a very important option. And refined mesh depends because sometimes it might create some um, useless triangulation. And sometimes you might want just to uh, increase, let's say, the minimum as length to have less faces. Because otherwise, it's going to refine every, every excruciating detail of your complex shape. But well, in this case, uh, the simpler control are more than enough. So what I'm getting is my mesh. And I can uh, move it back in place. A quick question, sir. Yep. How did you get the pop-up window for the options mesh? Oh, option? you, when you type uh, when you type mesh in the command yeah. line, it will tell you to select uh, surface, poly surfaces, and extrusion to mesh. I really had my poly surface selected, but you can reselect it, and you hit enter, and then you should have this pop up uh, for the mesh command. 
And the, the next one? The oh, you go to detailed controls. Oh, okay, all right, thank you. Or you go back to simple controls and you can go back and forth between simple and detailed controls. Okay, I'm putting the mesh back in place so it's aligned uh, with the with the handles and everything else. And at this point, I can also put this mesh in uh, in its own layer. Uh, if I am correct, I think that in your uh, file there is not this layer, not yet, right? So I'm gonna go and uh, delete it. So we are in, basically in the same situation. So here in the Component one, I'm going to create a new sublayer and call it mesh. So I'm just changing the layer to this one, so I know the mesh is there. And I can also, uh, so this part, uh, the poly surface, is now in the geometry general uh, layer that I can also switch off. So I am left uh, with all the relevant part that I need to reference into Grasshopper. Okay. So let's go to Grasshopper. Uh, actually, I need the layer because it's uh, it's going to be pretty handy to select all the things at once. So if you put the, the uh, part that you need in separate layers, it's easier to reference them later into Grasshopper. Uh, what I suggest you to do is to put uh, to make a layer for all the handles of the same type. And you put all the handles of the same type uh, in an individual layer. So if you have uh, handles of type uh, zero, they are all in one layer, handles of type one all in another layer, and actually make uh, layers and sublayers for each of the components. So the handles type zero for the component zero are in one layer, handles type zero for component type one are not in the same layer as the other ones. So uh, we're going to make some modifications here, but the first thing is that we have to reference all the handles in uh, in this curve component. So in Rhino, uh, we have this layer that is a handle sender. If you right click on it and say select objects, uh, you immediately have all the objects from that layer selected. And then you can go in Grasshopper in the curve component, uh, right click uh, and say set multiple curves. And then you have uh, in one shot uh, all of the handles selected together. So you see why I was suggesting to put uh, handles of the same type all in the same layer. Because then it doesn't matter how many they are, you, you have them from the get-go. Here uh, there's a thing. Uh, rotation angle should be, like I said, uh, a data tree made out of uh, rotations uh, and there should be a branch for each of the curves so we get 13 curves uh, so either we let's say that all of these handles we start with the basic uh, two orientation of 0 and 180 so we don't need this 0 90 180 but instead of uh, expanding this to 13 branches which is pretty long and boring we're going to do another thing so we need the, uh, a list uh, length uh, component. We're going to compose this uh, automatically. So it doesn't matter then how many, if you, all the handles need to have the same rotation, that it, it doesn't matter how many handles you reference, the rotations necessary will be automatically generated. And uh, let's uh, use uh, repeat data. And uh, not repeat, sorry, duplicate data. So the data that we want to duplicate are the angles. And we want to duplicate them as many times as the handles. So this will generate a sequence of uh, 0, 180, 0, 180, 26 uh, items. And then we need them, uh, by the way, let me delete this entwine. 
We need a, a copy of this list length, so we know how many rotation angles there's going to be. And then we're going to use a component called the partition list. So partition list takes every list and create partitions of the size that you tell him. So since it's a repetition of 0, 180, 0, 180, 0, 180, we say, okay, partition this list in slots of two, which is the length of this list. So what you get out of here is exactly the data tree of rotation that you need to work here. It's 13 branches of this from zero to branch 12 right there. We are just uh, adding a simplify here so that uh, the index uh, is just one index. And then we can feed the, the rotations here in the rotations. Uh, the type uh, goes more or less in the same way. The type, let's say that this is type, um, let's be the test. This, this is type zero for all of them. And we're going to get this couple of components, the length and the duplicate data. So we duplicate this, uh, yeah, sorry, the length is still, sorry, the length is still the length of the number of handles, not uh, this list. So we're gonna generate like 13 uh, zeros, graft, uh, simplify and pull this in. And we actually gonna give weight zero, so we, we also can, uh, no, actually we cannot, we, we need, we don't need to graph this in order to simplify because there is in the component. And actually we can also plug this as weight because we are not, not using weights right now for the handles. So the handles are all right at the moment, right? So we created the handles and that's okay. Uh, we need to reference our mesh. So what we do here is say, okay, set one mesh and set this one, and we are okay. Uh, if you want, you can change uh, the reference plane. Uh, right now, the reference plane is uh, somewhere around the centroid, but uh, yeah, it's somewhere in here. It's like inside or yeah, in this position in here, because that's where it, it's uh, automatically positioned according to the centroid of volume of the mesh. But uh, the plane can be also placed manually. If you want to place the orientation plane or use a different orientation plane and place it manually wherever you want, uh, it doesn't matter. You can do that. Uh, it's just remember that this reference plane is the one that is going to be used to orient, uh, let's say, the final geometry and any other characteristics later. Since we're going to use just uh, this component, we, not, we do not need this second one. So we can either delete or uh, freeze this, disable this component uh, group here. I'm just going to disable everything. And I think the heuristics, yeah, the heuristic engine is working already. And it should be showing uh, yeah, since we have a pretty high number of handles, the number of combinations, as you can see, it's pretty extensive as well. And there are also some uh, unwanted combination with the component is compenetrating itself. So, here we can also increase the number of uh, rows. So instead, let's put a maximum of 20. And let's go to, let's go to 20 actually. See how it looks. Yeah, there's a pretty extensive amount of uh, 
combinations that have been generated and then filtered out. So you can see there are some uh, interesting, uh, interesting possible combination here at work. So okay, it doesn't really, I don't really mind that much. So uh, that's okay by me. Let's uh, save these heuristics and then see how they work uh, in an assemblage. So we're gonna save them uh, inside the heuristics. Uh, let me just delete the extra text file here. Uh, full heuristics, let's call this full heuristics uh, exa. Okay. Oh, it's null because, uh, yeah, uh, this is some parts. Uh, if you see this, you try to save uh, it, the, the message says null. If you notice, there's an orange cable here. This is because uh, also these components from uh, Frog are user object, and sometimes uh, they do not load the, uh, when you open the definition. So all you have to do is just to deactivate and reactivate them. So you see now the, the cable is black. It means that it's delivering uh, the proper path. And now if you save, uh, it will save correctly. So it might happen if you notice a orange cable or it's not saving and you see an all there, that is most probably the reason. So, okay, uh, let's go again. Uh, into the, let me see if I have it open already. Oh yeah. I got this simple random assemblage uh, that I'm going to save. Uh, uh, this is the one that we were using to show the load and save. So I'm gonna save this as um, another document. Mm. Let's go to day two. Simple random assemblage uh, hexa. So uh, now I need to, I don't need these guys here because I need to bring in uh, my assembly object components with the hexa inside. So I'm getting rid of those. Uh, and getting uh, these ones there. Oops. Just this one. And that's uh, paste in place. Oh, this really place. Okay. So let's uh, bring this. Uh, let me detach the previous assemblage uh, from here. So there is no previous assemblage and uh, let's load the, the right uh, heuristics. Is that here? I'm not seeing the hexa here. Um, Let's see where I did save the heuristic here. Hmm. Where did I save this? In, uh, in which folder? Day 02 heuristics. So is this, oh, this is day zero one. Oh, that's why. So let me save this again uh, in the day zero two folder. Sorry, my bad. Day zero two. No, oh, but it is day zero two. Wait, I'm in day zero two. So, ah, because uh, same thing, it needs to be refreshed. Okay, now I'm seeing the correct folder. 
Sorry, sometimes this guy needs to be kicked up. Okay, so the full heuristics exa is the number one. So now I should have, uh, yeah, it's still named stick, although it's not a stick, but yeah, I forgot to change the name. But the rules are, yeah. These are the rules, the correct ones. So, 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 if I hit reset, uh, the starting point is there. So, ah, because we are in a very, very different scale. So, it's weird because if I hit reset, ah, because I have also the loaded parts that I'm seeing here. Sorry. I was wondering why I was still seeing things there. Okay, so let's move this point around uh, so that uh, we start seeing something uh, in terms of object. Uh, let's reset. Uh, okay, there we go. Let's start uh, with one step and see how it goes. Because if it's too slow, and I don't want to start with uh, like a hundred step right away. So you see, remember what I told you about the, the pink objects? These are all the candidates. So every time uh, you will uh, make a, a step, uh, these are all the possible candidates, uh, uh, provided that they are filtered by the uh, collision. So there are like 270 candidates you will have to choose from. So if we use a, a, a more thoughtful criteria other than random, uh, with these many, um, these many uh, uh, handles, the system might take a long time uh, thinking about it. So since it's random, uh, it's gonna take a while, but just to retrieve the candidates, uh, it's not a big deal. But uh, also, the candidates will uh, basically uh, diminish uh, the more objects we start to add because then you're going to have more possible collision with others around. But you see also 20 steps is taking its time to do stuff. Well, can we have a zoom? Okay. Yeah, maybe uh, according to the number of handles, there it would be wise to be a little bit more selective with the heuristics and not to put everything uh, in place. But uh, it's just to see, okay, let's see what these guys can do somehow. Let's switch this off. Yeah, if you proceed uh, randomly, the connection possibilities are so many that uh, it might evolve uh, in a very, very random way. I mean, the, the expression of the system is just as random as the criteria in this case. But you can see, uh, if you look at it from uh, some points of view, there is already a strong uh, geometric basis for, uh, for order due to the uh, Design of the component itself, and if you look at if you look at, at uh, let's say some sort of a person's point of view, this is uh, pretty chaotic still. So it needs to be disciplined uh, in terms of uh, the kind of heuristics that I'm uh, going to choose. So it might take uh, a little more in this case. Not the problem would not be in this case refining or changing the design of the component but uh, experimenting a lot uh, with filtering the heuristics right because we need putting the right limitation in place so that not really everything is possible maybe this guy has been given too much leeway but there are the first uh, impressions of the possibilities of uh, implementing something interesting out of it. 
So just to show that, uh, like I said before, you have to go through all the stages of the workflow. Right now, I'm not dealing into the post-processing because maybe that could be uh, a little bit, uh, I mean, in, in the very, very first uh, in early stages, it's more getting to the assemblage and the rules of the assemblage. But as soon as you have something convincing, I would uh, say that it's also the case to start trying immediately some post-processing uh, strategies from uh, adding uh, selectively some geometry to considering something related to the filtering criteria, uh, designing uh, a scenario of uh, how the flow are going uh, through the system and then uh, maybe filtering the components accordingly. I don't know, the most frequented path uh, might have uh, some added elements to them or a different version to them. Or actually the path could not uh, be related to personal, to, to people's circulation at all. They could be path of uh, minimal energy for something, for stress, for hydraulic circulation, for electricity, for whatever you, it comes to, to your mind. It's a structure, uh, it's like an hardware willing to work uh, with some data flowing through it. And uh, you have to figure out uh, what you want to make uh, flow through it or what, what is the takeaway if you try to make something flow through it and uh, what sense do you want to make of it. So, uh, okay, I think that for this last hour, I would like to leave you to some uh, experimentation slash play with, uh, with some design. And anytime uh, you want to, um, to show something or you want advice on something, I'll be here, just uh, ping me. I'm just uh, muting my microphone to not be obnoxious. But if you need something, just ask, uh, uh, speak your mind on the microphone or uh, right now I'm following the chat so you can also write a message in the chat. And uh, at the, preferably by tomorrow, not necessarily in this hour, but uh, let's say you can uh, chat it over uh, among yourselves. Uh, uh, by tomorrow morning, it would be nice to know uh, what are the couples uh, for the design for the project, right? Who you want to work with? Uh, sorry? Yeah, uh, I have a question. Uh, for, yeah, sure. For now, you, you the examples you, you showed to us mm -hmm. were only very, um, with very few different elements. Like mm -hmm. one to one uh, of these case and the two. Yeah. Uh, is there a reason why uh, you you prefer to stay with very few elements, or if we maybe we can have like five or six elements, very simple elements, but like uh, different L shapes or uh, T mm -hmm. shapes, X, uh, etc., uh, that could assemble. Uh, yeah, no. The, the reason is mostly because it takes uh, time to to prepare the objects. Uh, and uh, demonstrating with one or two uh, doesn't kill the process. It's just a different result. But uh, there is another reason which is uh, um, cautionary in terms of design. I mean, uh, what, you, what you mentioned, uh, it's a, a, pretty, a pretty good uh, strategy to try to go for. But sometimes uh, when you increase the number of components, the temptation is always uh, to increase the number to increase the variety of the components. So that in the end, uh, you lose the quality of organization emerging. So if, let's say, if you make elements that are all uh, similar, but maybe, I don't know, it's L elements of different length, let's say. Actually, the section I, try, I, I wanted to try with, uh, you know, PVC pipes. Like uh -huh. Standard plastic pipes and big assemblage uh, of pipes like this. So it's suddenly it's all, all um, always the same diameters, but uh, you have different connections that can evolve in some complex mm -hmm. formal geometries. But the, the base, the fundamental element is very mm -hmm. simple. 
Yeah, no, the, the thing that I was uh, cautionary about is uh, uh, increasing the number. Uh, sometimes it's not per se a big deal. The, the problem in the design outcome comes when uh, with the, an increasing number comes an increasing variety. It means uh, apples and oranges together. Too many different fruits together, right? If it's variation on the same uh, uh, thing uh, for which you need the different objects uh, and you have a larger number of parts, but uh, all in all, uh, this doesn't affect, uh, I mean, it's variation on the same part, but not variety, that's a different thing. Okay, thanks. Welcome. Anyone wants to work on making the design from voids? Do they like this idea or not? Sorry? I was again? like everybody else trying to ah. find a partner who likes to work on the voids on the like from nothing, designing from like box. I, I like this idea a lot. Just maybe somebody Yeah, I could I could join you. Like, that's good. Okay. Nice. <laughs> okay, uh, let's uh, make a, just a, a question of order. Uh, just send me a collective email by tomorrow morning with all the list of the couples who will be working together. Anybody, somebody will take charge of doing this and uh, you send it to me tomorrow. That'll be okay, because otherwise I will uh, have a hard time keeping track of everything. So do it as you please. Uh, I don't know, you can prepare a Google Sheet and uh, you fill in and then you send me the link to the sheet. Uh, that's fine for me. Is there a possibility to, I don't know, I've never done this, like with group work on Zoom, like are there different rooms or? I don't know if there is a... Like different chambers to work together or should we... I think you can, uh, you can chat. Thread? I don't know. Uh, uh, for sure, I think you can chat privately among each other. Okay. Uh, I've never done this, but there is, I think there's the possibility to do break rooms, uh, breakout rooms, but I've never. I think you need to enable us to be able to chat to another because I only. Ah, there are, we, you aren't right, so far. Sorry. That's. Mm, what? Wait a second. Wait, 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 wait. Uh, let me just uh, see where I can. Uh... Oh. Mm -mm. Uh, let me stop sharing the screen for a moment. So I get back the controls in the Zoom window because otherwise it's really. I don't know if it allows me to do that. Uh, can I select people? Mm. No, but I what I can do is I can uh, do a breakout room and assign you all to to a breakout room. Let's see if that works. But I don't know what will happen after I hit the create rooms. <laughs> Let's see. Let's see. Let's try this. Uh, are we all there? Yeah. Options. Uh, okay, you will be able to return to, me, to the main session at any time. So. Um, Let's see. 
Okay, I have uh, I've created a breakout room. Can you see it? Okay, so you can go into the breakout room and return here at any time. So you can uh, discuss uh, among yourself. I won't be in the breakout room. We'll just be here for the YouTubers to bore them to death. Okay, I can uh, share my screen back. I want to go back to these other component sets here. Yeah. So for the YouTubers connected now, the guys in my workshop are in a breakout room and they are discussing on how to form groups and form couples for their uh, design project. So I think the tutorial part, uh, uh, it's mostly over for today. There might be some, uh, some considerations uh, in questions and answer back and forth once they are back but I, I think I'm going to show much more. So if you were interested more in the tutorial part, I think that for today we are done. There might be something else tomorrow, depend if I can uh, cook up something, uh, uh, if I manage to cook up something for tomorrow morning. But otherwise, uh, uh, please feel free to leave the stream because there, I don't know if there's going to be something more, uh, something relevant again for, uh, for you, but thanks you for watching whoever you. <laughs> Okay.
Hello, someone's back, finally. Hi. <laughs> we, sorry we took some time to introduce ourselves because we thought... Nice, uh, yeah, you're right. Uh, I, wow, and I'm so inconsiderate. I usually do that in workshops, but this Zoom thing really... Ah, uh, man. Uh, doing great. Everything is fine, actually. Yeah, everybody is doing like... It's new field for everybody. There is always Zoom, and there is something like other things that MS Teams or whatever. So yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I mean it's just uh, it's really the the first time that I am teaching a workshop uh, uh, and not being in presence. So some things are still a bit uh, cumbersome to to me, and uh, I still have to make sense. Uh, just let me answer. To the question of chat. Uh, is everybody done or uh, are someone's waiting? Because otherwise, uh, uh, we were 11 in other, uh, in the breakout room. There are like four people still in the breakout room. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, no, I can see who is in the breakout room. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I'm still in control. Yeah, uh, Luis, one of the auditors uh, was asking if he could ask a question because actually we were working at some point I was right at the point to say, okay, let's ask the auditors if they have some question. Right at the moment you started coming back. So. <laughs> now, I mean, if you don't have anything pressing, I would like uh, to open the questions to the auditors uh, right away. Otherwise, of course, you take precedence if you have something to ask or... Because we have like uh, roughly half an hour left. Okay, maybe I have one small question. We uh, yes. we discussed with Alexander uh, some strategy for for the for the development of the parts. Mm -hmm. and the the idea is uh, to use sort of uh, pipe parts mm -hmm. and uh, first assemble uh, object of this construction parts and then. Uh, from this object, which which would be maybe more spacious, construct bigger elements. But so I, I just want to ask if how you look at it, if that's a good idea. Although I know you told us like not to mess so much with the details and the construction parts. Mm. Well, uh, it could work uh, provided that you have uh, the right focus on the right scale. I mean, if the geometry is made out of surfaces or pipes, uh, it's uh, it's actually it's more on you guys because then you will have to deal with a lot more geometrical complexity in terms of quantity, right? You have to deal with a lot more elements. But I'm not opposed to that. Actually, I saw the the PDF that you sent through the email about the scaffolds. If you want to go that way, it's an interesting idea because actually you're creating. Uh, a lot of void, like a very lattice-like structure with the scaffolds. So if that's the idea, I mean, that's a good focus because even if you're using, uh, let's say, very slender elements uh, as a basis, the, the scale objective uh, is not so much the construction piece itself, but it has a larger uh, objective in terms of scale. So to me, it looks good. I'm actually curious. <laughs> Is, uh, the, the thing to have two scales um, would be to, on the um, scale of the room, let's say, uh, would be to have quite dense, um, uh, having a high density uh, of pipes or bars. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Think, and uh, play with um, uh, vector fields to orient and um, to uh, deal with this um, big amount of pipes, maybe. Um, yeah. Connection yeah. for the assembly assemble rooms. Oh, I don't know how to call that. No, no, it's okay. It's okay. Yeah, yeah, that's right. That's right. Uh, I have a couple of ideas uh, that 
uh, just popped into my mind while you were talking, but I will keep them for myself to see how you develop the things first. Because I don't want to, you know, burden you too much with uh, too many inputs at this point. It's more uh, a prompt to start. Uh, actually, you know what, we, we never discussed this and I didn't uh, want to lock this uh, uh, workshop uh, outcome to a specific site or a specific place, uh, but more or less in terms of uh, the kind of scale and scope uh, we are looking at. So if anybody uh, of you uh, would like to have uh, a prompt uh, and says, okay, give me a site to work on, I have something for you. But if you want to apply it, then you have uh, something that, oh, I would like to apply it to, to this particular situation or, or site, uh, uh, let me know. We can talk about it. I mean, I'm totally open. Uh, what I had in mind was like a sort of a strip of terrain that is uh, roughly 300 meters long and 50 meters or 30 meters wide. And it shouldn't be completely saturated, but let's say that uh, the, the kind of idea is um, if you want uh, a more in-depth uh, focus at the architectural scale, is to try to uh, have something uh, to have an output that uh, has both the qualities of an architecture and of an urban scale, which means uh, it challenges the, the traditional conception of the building and that the urban is made of a single stacked building and uh, the, the public space is what uh, lies between the building somehow. But it would like to reach the point in which you have this very big uh, assemblages in which the public spaces is able to transverse inside the building itself. So the construction is like a unique construction, but it's like a, a sequence of uh, spatial experiences, or spatial episodes that can be transversed uh, also freely. So it has like three parts, segregated parts. So you do uh, something that uh, starts with the uh, basic building block of a spatial unit that can be the size of a room, the size of a conference room, the size of whatever you decide uh, you want to have, even though you don't have to, to, do it, to give it a specific function, it's just to fix the possible range of proportions. But then in the end, uh, you, you try to put as many instances as you can. So grow the assemblers to the highest possible number of instances that your computer can uh, can manage before breaking up and see see where you get. I mean, my, my idea is more, okay, let's uh, infuse in this as much complexity as possible, starting from the simplest element possible. Let's try to extract uh, the maximum possible complexity out of the organization uh, qualities, mostly. I mean, while I try to reduce the number of um, the number of heuristics uh, in, in, for this component, it got slightly better, but there's still some work to do. <laughs> as you can see from from the picture, it's still pretty confusing as an object, but it starts showing uh, uh, better qualities all in all. Looks like something you can do out of plywood, by the way. <laughs> One of those assemblage kit of plywood that you buy at Christmas. Just slightly more complicated. I have a question. Sure. As uh, we have to work with this larger number of 10,000 elements at the end, mm -hmm. which is the process that can create uh, the, the biggest problem in terms of uh, quantity mm -hmm. for the programs uh, to think about. Uh, mm -hmm. It's like uh, the, when we created the shape, uh, when we try to make the connection, uh, is there a specific step when we have to keep our attention very high uh, to reduce yeah. the number of the possibilities so the system can work properly? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, being uh, uh, mainly a problem of uh, quantity of things, uh, the the culprit in this case uh, the the major focus of your attention should be in keeping the uh, building blocks 
at the low complexity in terms of number of faces. That, of course, uh, because that's the, the basic thing. If you have 10,000 uh, elements, uh, of course, everything uh, you put in the, in the components, in, it's multiplied 10,000 times. So if you have one face, it's 10,000 faces in the end. If you have 10 faces, it's going to be 100,000 faces. If you have 100 faces, it's going to be a million faces. So that's, uh, that's one of the crucial aspects. Uh, but then uh, you can also, uh, I mean, this is mostly uh, tasking for the process of assemblage. Because all in all, uh, I mean, if you have, uh, I mean, I, I have a very, very old computer. You won't believe me. I have a MacBook from 2011 running Windows on Bootcamp. That's why it was almost melting when I was doing the, the first test uh, with Zoom and everything. But uh, if you have a fairly more decent computer, you can uh, pretty well handle the, ge the dead geometry, the geometry that is not processing in Grasshopper. And you can also proceed uh, uh, by chunks, uh, uh, using uh, cleverly the save and load, uh, and also moving around the container for the environment. So uh, just to make a very, very quick, like sort of pseudo, I'm not doing like a live demonstration, just making like a conceptual diagram here. Okay, so let me switch this, reset this off. So let's say that uh, you start uh, with uh, a container for the environment. Hello. And you decide that your first uh, chunk that you develop is here, right? You model a containment for your environment, and then you start the assemblage, and you get to a certain point. Then you save it. And then you say, OK, let's go this way. Then you load the, this part. You can even uh, partially filter the list of the components to just the components that are crossing this part here and then you go on. And the rest, uh, you can save it in a separate file. Then you go on by chunks. And then in the end, you can load uh, all the files together in the final file. But while you are processing, uh, you are just dealing with the limited part of your uh, assemblage. And you don't have uh, to wait exponentially for the system to, to elaborate all the parts uh, that are, you don't have to, you know, get to 9,000 to get to 10,000. You can process them like uh, if you want 100 at a time. I mean, uh, with the very, but I can tell you, even with my computer, with very, very simple parts uh, like uh, the stick and the L, uh, and with uh, almost uh, like three or four heuristics, uh, the system. Uh, gets to 10,000 parts uh, with uh, no problem. It's just a matter, I mean, in the first version, when uh, you didn't have to think too much, uh, it, it was getting to 5,000 parts in 15 seconds, just randomly going. Now it has uh, a lot more, uh, let's say, programming weight on it, uh, and it's not that fast anymore, but uh, it, it has uh, the possibility to think a little bit. But if you still go, uh, with whatever criteria. I mean, the problem uh, is more in the waiting times than in the capacity to manage geometry. I mean, the, the time will dilate a lot. But definitely, first thing, uh, the complexity of the object. Second, uh, how many heuristics you're using at, 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 uh, in, the, in the assemblage. As you just see with the example of this, uh, this guy here, this guy had like 13 handles all of the same type. There were like 270 rules, which is uh, way too many. So yeah, I was just, just out of the experiment, I just wanted to see what would happen. But uh, it's just like a, a good game. A good game shouldn't have uh, too many rules, uh, because otherwise it becomes so cumbersome and less elegant.
the elegant thing in this case is that uh, you have uh, you extract the complexity from the outcome, but actually the process is quite streamlined, quite slender in itself. So you have to go and pick up, okay, I understand from the heuristic reader and the writer that uh, this is uh, an interesting set of combinations, so I can uh, use this. Maybe don't put uh, as many handles as I did in the system. <laughs> Because that was just to that was just a test in this case to test also the limitation of this. Excuse me, may I ask uh, some question about the code you write in C sharp? Sure. Uh, can you please uh, holistically uh, te um, tell us how you uh, put two? Uh, things together and how they check if the other parts are there. Uh, so you tell if there is uh, something in there, it will become a minus one, I think. And uh, I tried to uh, do this in my project and I do mm. this with the point, points. If points are uh, overlapping, it checks. Mm -hmm. But with if conditions, if they are overlapping, overlapping so it becomes false, but it become very heavy for my computer. I wonder how mm. did you uh, do it that it's so fast? Okay. Uh, well, I'm first of all, I'm not. I don't consider myself like a, a, a very good programmer. I know. I think enough of programming, and but uh, uh, let's say a real programmer. I don't know what his reaction or her reaction would be if. Uh, she, he will see my code, but uh, let me try to sketch it in broad strokes. Uh, so uh, what I'm using uh, is uh, I create uh, objects in C-sharp. So I use object-oriented programming because it's uh, a lot more flexible than uh, what Grasshopper allows you to do. The closest thing that Grasshopper has in this vanilla state are those geometry groups, but they can go only so far. So when you do object-oriented programming, the object can have uh, as many qualities and characteristics as you want. And every instance uh, of the same uh, class of object will uh, uh, have the same uh, possible characteristic, and then you give uh, uh, a value to those characteristics. So uh, every time you create an assembly object, you create one of those uh, uh, particular objects that uh, are incorporating all these characteristics. So in the main engine, uh, we have a catalog of the objects. So he knows, he can recognize the object uh, of a particular type. Uh, he can uh, take from a catalog, uh, make a copy of the object, and then translate it or transform it to go into place. So the idea is this, uh, first of all, uh, the engine chooses the starting point, and then uh, you have this uh, particular criteria. So let's say we stick with the random criteria just for simplicity of explanation. Of all the possible uh, items uh, that are in the assemblage, uh, of all the ones that are available, it just uh, picks one at random. And then uh, it looks at the object. Let's say that we start with the first uh, object, the first instant, the, the very first one. So there's only one in object in the scene. All of his handles are free, right? So I'm choosing the object at random. There's only one object, so I'm choosing the one. I'm choosing one handle at random. Uh, they are all available, so I'm choosing one. The moment I made this choice, uh, then uh, I have uh, just a limited range of options. No, actually, the moment, sorry, I don't choose the handle. Uh, let me take it back. Uh, this was my old uh, algorithm. The new algorithm, uh, the one that it's in here, once you choose the component, looks at all the available handle in that component. And according to the rules, he orients in place uh, all the possible other objects that can uh, that are compatible with those handles. So this is why uh, when I have these many rules uh, and I make a tentative attempt, there were so many pink objects around. These are the tentative objects that it places. So let's say that uh, the system chooses one. Okay, uh, I have the object uh, and I have the next object in place, and I'm checking if that is a valid object or not which means uh, I need to, first of all, 
I am checking if there is a, a possible conflict uh, with environmental objects. So I am checking if it's centroid is inside or outside the, the environmental meshes first. Uh, I'm doing this check first because it's uh, the fastest one. Then uh, is checking the collision with the other object in the assemblage. To check the collision, uh, the, there is a, a quite a simple trick actually, uh, which is, uh, I mean, the, the connection is decided in, uh, by the rules. So I'm not looking if the points are coincident. I already know that I chosen the spot where the object should be. So if the object is okay, I already know who's connected with who without placing any points. So it doesn't have to do this uh, geometric verification. But once I try to place something in place, I need to know if the two geometries do not uh, compenetrate. And there is a, a common in Rhino Common, which is called the uh, uh, mesh mesh collision fast that fires through if two meshes are uh, in contact or they are compenetrating each other. The problem is uh, with this command that you have false positives. So uh, if two meshes are touching uh, by one face, uh, this would be a good connection in terms of our assemblies, but uh, it's a false positive for the mesh mesh collision uh, command. So the way I did it is to offset a little bit uh, the mesh inside. So it's just slightly smaller, but that the amount that uh, avoids the face by touching. So the objects are not exactly touching, but they are almost exactly in the place where they should be, but that almost is good enough in terms of tolerance to check if there are collisions with other objects around. So if the object uh, exactly fits in place, uh, the object will stay. But if uh, the object is just slightly even compenetrating with something else, uh, it will be discarded. So that's basically the thing. So it's actually every object, uh, uh, when you create the assembly object as the mesh that you create and a slightly offset version of the same mesh that it uses for collision checking. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, I would open the, the floor to questions also by, by the auditors now because it's uh, five. So if any auditors want to step up asking, I mean, no problem. And of course, if you also have other questions, uh, I'm available. So. I'm happy to, to answer. Uh, uh, sorry. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> uh, just one question. Yeah. We are making the groups with auditors? No, just participants. OK. How do we know who are participants? Only from I, email, uh, right? I will send you a list, uh, or if you look at the if you look at the mailing list uh, of the first email, mm -hmm. it was sent just to you participants. I have to separate mailing lists. So if you look at the addresses of the participants uh, in the first one of the first email that I sent to you, okay, you should be able to see it. Or let me let me do that also because I also have. Uh, your list in txt file, uh, your email list in txt file. But yeah, I can uh, I can resend an email to everybody for group making mm -hmm. so that you have uh, right there. Oh, um, I've uh, sent it, so you should receive the email 
with your address. So thank you. Welcome. So yeah, the floor is open to questions. Hi. Hello. Hi. Hi, hello. Hi. Hello. Well, uh, first, um, I would like to thank you for uh, letting me in uh, and uh, attend the session as an auditor. Um, no problem. I, I find it very interesting because it seems to me that it is uh, very reminiscent of the work of uh, Gilles Retzin and uh, Daniel Keller on uh, mm -hmm on meteorological systems. And uh, I, I find it uh, very, uh, very fascinating. I myself, uh, wor I'm working on a similar topic with uh, another type of algorithm that is called the, the, the wave collapse function. I don't know if you've heard about it. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah I know. I actually have uh, done my own version of where the wave function collapse. I was also okay. undecided if you use it for this workshop or not. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, I, I first had a, a question uh, regarding um, the, circ the circulation system. Yes. Uh, at, at first, I thought that it was the, the lines. Uh, at first, I thought it was some sort of uh, straight ske skeleton or medial axis. Mm -hmm. But then when I'm looking at the, the, the piece that you are showing right now on your screen, Mm -hmm. it seems that the lines are flowing along the surfaces of uh, the, the uh, that yes that, that piece that you mean the pink shows. lines right yes right right and my question is how did you compute this uh, the, this line how no, did you make I, the connections yeah no wait uh, these lines are uh, just uh, uh, th this network uh, uh, is up to you to model the only okay. requirement is that uh, when you put the pieces together, the extremities of that network in one component uh, uh, become coincident with the extremity or one or more extremity of the other network. They just are representative of uh, how do you want the circulation to flow okay. in this part. So, uh, for instance, in this case, uh, since there is no handle here, no connection, it means that uh, this will become a segregated space. So there is uh, one uh, branch of the circulation that ends here. So that when I look for, let's say, dead spots in the network, I know they will uh, end up uh, either, it, if they are coincident with some handle, they will lead to an outside connection, or otherwise there will be dead spot inside my system. Which means that I, I will, I, I'm ended up in a, in a dead, in an end zone or in a dead zone uh, in the network. But you design it uh, as you see fit uh, to. That's uh, the the way you want to design the circulation in your component, really. Okay, I I see. You saying. I, thank you. So it's, it's not. It means that it's it's not automated. You have to to hard code it or to 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 make the mm. connection by hand. You can also automate it somehow if you find a way. But um, right now, I find it more convenient to making it as a part of the design of the component. So you actually do design whatever you want to be the circulation. So it might also become coincident with the, a certain kind of pattern. So it, uh, let's say, narrows the distance between abstract uh, and practical in, in that case. But it's really up to uh, a design choice if you want to automate it and for what purpose do you want to automate it? Or for what purpose you want to design it manually? Okay, I got it, thank you. No problem. Uh, you guys, any any other question? Anything uh, anything else? Oh, we got uh, Mustafa back. What are our deliverables at the very end? You have to send me a physical model of your project to my home address. 
<laughs> no, I'm kidding. <laughs> of course. No, the deliverables, I, I haven't compiled an extensive list uh, of them uh, because, uh, I mean, for certain, uh, I would like you to produce uh, images, possibly some animation. And one uh, thing that I would like to have from each group uh, is uh, to output uh, a file in Modelo so that it's a navigable, explorable model in 3D that stays on the web. So the only, let's say, the only fixed uh, goal is to get the, the Modelo file. Then uh, I didn't have made an extensive list, but uh, tomorrow or also the day after tomorrow, I can show you a little bit more what is the flavor of the deliverables that I would like to have. Let's say I, want, I don't like to make a very extensive list in this case. But I can show you that it's not just about uh, renderings. Uh, I would like to also have uh, some uh, interesting uh, diagrams and schematics that make sense of the information that you are managing and distributing through the system. That is for certain one thing that I can tell you right, uh, also right now for sure. So the core aspect of the, of the workshop is actually more on the side of uh, how you decide to design, manage, uh, and manipulate information through a system that is distributed into space. Of course, the perceptual qualities are also a part of the entire design system because they enter as, uh, at many levels, both as an assessment uh, filter or also, I mean, you can uh, look at the system in many, in, from many perspectives. It might look perfectly fine and order from the outset, but then when you experience it at the first person level, you see that the perception might be completely different. So that kind of uh, consideration should also partially enter the, the, the loop. But I mean, it's just like, uh, little more than two days project, so I don't want to put too much, uh, too much pressure on it, you know. Appreciate it. Yeah, no, I mean, guys, it's some, it's a place where, of course, you have to put some effort, but it's uh, for learning purpose first, uh, and to have some uh, takeaway in terms of uh, how we can grow in terms of knowledge, or how we can exchange in terms of knowledge, not like, uh, I don't see a, a purpose in, uh, let's say, beating the crap out of you because you have to deliver this much. Uh, I mean, not, not my goal. I would like also to have, if you have any sort of feedback uh, that you can think on the, um, on the workflow itself, on the system, you say, hey, uh, in, my, in my mind, uh, I think this could be improved uh, if you do it this way, or why don't you try this thing? Uh, and see if, if that gets better. I mean, for me, it's also experimental in that sense, so. Thank you. That said, I will beat the crap out of you if you don't deliver. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if he... If it was like a different uh, environment uh, with uh, with a different uh, kind of stake, uh, uh, yes, that there would be maybe more pressure, but still uh, the kind of pressure that uh, uh, that it's enough to to fire up your creative impulse and your curiosity to explore, not the pressure that puts you into a state of anxiety. Uh, do we have anything tomorrow, like a meeting, or now for the next two days we're only working? In no, uh, probably, uh, let's say that I will keep the morning loose. Uh, maybe I can show you something in the hour between 12 and uh, 1 p.m. Because that, uh, I mean, I will be available from 9 a.m. if you want. Uh, I will, uh, but I, I don't have uh, in mind to show anything in particular, or actually, would you prefer if I have to show something that I do it in the early morning or in the uh, hour from 12 to 1? 
from 12 to 1 is actually the time where most of the talks are happening. Like, it's weird because when I look at the timetable, actually the, the talks were like, uh, I calculated the timetable. The talks should be like in between uh, 10 and 11 and uh, 1 and 3 p.m. Well, it's, or I don't know. Not, maybe it's in the GMT time, but today it was 12, 2 and 6, I think, and midnight. I, I checked it. So, uh, well, I think they changed something because when uh, when we uh, they asked me to, that's why we have this weird schedule of one hour and one hour and then afternoon. But uh, yeah, tomorrow, I mean, we are, uh, from tomorrow, we are really loose. So if you prefer to do it in the morning from 9 to 10, Okay, well, maybe I can carry on. Um, sure. Hello? Are you speaking? I don't know. <laughs> and somebody activated the mic by mistake, probably. Uh, no, I mean, uh, if you prefer to do something between 9 and 10, so also that you we do that uh, at the very early morning and then you have the rest of the day to work without breaks, uh, that is fine by me. Uh, I'll see if I, if I can uh, prepare, some, I think I, have, I can prepare something, but on the other hand, I, I really don't want to put too many things on the table. I think you have already plenty to work with uh, right now, yeah. right? In, in case we have some questions, what's the best way to get to you? Uh, is it Zoom or the email that you have, the official email address you have? Uh, I would like to, because I, I would like to keep uh, the channel open uh, in case uh, we the, the answer might interest uh, everyone. Okay. So, um, yeah, let's say that we keep uh, the same uh, kind of uh, schedule. Uh, I'll be here also in the with the youtube uh, live it's if necessary so if you want to if you have any questions i will be here to answer from 8 to 9 from 12 to 1 and from uh, 2 to 5 p.m. right any other moment you can shoot me an email if it's something that it's uh, uh, of uh, collective interest uh, if i enable i will reply to everybody or otherwise, I will uh, point to the next uh, possible session so that uh, I can give an answer for, for everyone. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. So, good. Uh, well, I will see you any, in any case tomorrow morning at 9, so at least uh, we might uh, discuss. That could be a, a good thing to do in any case for tomorrow morning, if you have the chance to talk among each other, to discuss uh, more or less what is your general intention as a, as a, in terms of project. Some of you have already expressed this, uh, but it could be nice to make a round of, uh, let's say, uh, kickstart for uh, for the project like this, say, okay, let's see where you can go. If you have already sketched something, you can show me something, what do you want? Okay? Yeah. Good. Okay. So then I'll uh, see you tomorrow morning, guys. Thank you, have a nice Thank you, thank you so thank much. You. Thank, you. Thank, thank, you. You. thank you, have a nice evening and see you tomorrow. See you tomorrow, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye. Thank you. Bye, bye, bye.